Hello and welcome to the Once Again Podcast. We are your hosts, Ashley and Jason. In this very special bonus episode, we will be looking at the 1972 film, The Godfather. This, and I have it written here too, again, this special bonus episode of the Once Again Podcast is for my birthday. Happy birthday, Jason. So, keep your listeners close and your haters closer, and enjoy this episode. The Godfather is a 19... (laughs) You're going to recover from my little intro there? I'm not going to (laughs) recover. I'll give you a minute, a minute to get over that. Um, you weren't expecting me to sing the theme song. Well, to hum the theme song, I guess, or whatever. You know, there's actually a, a version with words uh, someone like wrote later. It's called Speak Softly, um, Speak Softly Love. Speak Softly Love and... Da, 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 da. Like, it has words to it, someone wrote later. But The Godfather is a 1972 American epic crime film based on the best-selling... 1969 novel of the same title. It is the first installment in the Godfather trilogy, chronicling the Corleone family under patriarch Vito Corleone from 1945 to 1955. It focuses on the transformation of his youngest son, Michael Corleone, from reluctant family outsider to ruthless mafia boss. Directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Screenplay by Mario Puzo and Francis Ford Coppola. Based on The Godfather by Mary Puzo. Produced by Albert S. Ruddy. Edited by William Reynolds and Peter Zinner. Music by Nino Rota. Production companies Paramount Pictures and Alfred Productions. Distributed by Paramount Pictures. Runtime of 175 minutes. Starring Marlon Brando as Vito Corleone. Al Pacino as Michael Corleone. James Caan as Sonny. Richard Castellano as Peter Clumza. Robert Duvall as Tom Hagen, Al Terry as Virgil Solozo, Diane Keaton as Kay Adams Corleone, Abe Vigoda as Salvatore Tessio, Talia Shear as Connie Corleone, John Casal as Fredo Corle- Frida Corleone. Oh my god. Um, Too much Italian names. So we actually have someone in here in that list of the cast that showed up in something else that we covered. Abe Vigoda. He was in Mask of the Phantasm. Ah. He was uh, the crime boss that was on Oxygen. I can't remember his name now. But, uh, you know, from Mask of the Phantasm, like when he was young. Mm -hmm. um, And then he was on Oxygen in the present timeline in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not coming to me, the character's name. And I used to know that movie inside and out. Oh, well, this one I know inside and out. (laughs) Um, But I have some little facts about it. I wanted to get the names out of the way, just in case this little facts went a little too long and I wanted to cut this. But The Godfather premiered at Lowe's State Theater on March 14th, 1972, and was widely released in the United States on March 24th, 1972. It was the highest grossing film of 1972, and was for the time the highest grossing film ever made, earning between 250 and 291 million at the box office. The film was well-received by critics and audiences who praised its performances, direction, screenplay, writing, story, cinematography, editing, score, and portrayal of the Mafia. The Godfather launched the successful careers of Pacino, Coppola, and other relative newcomers in the cast and crew. Which is actually interesting. Coppola, I think The Godfather was his seventh film, if I'm not mistaken, and he had already done... No, I can't think of the other big one that he did before this, but this really put him on the map. Um, this was per, uh, Pacino's first movie, though, I believe. The film also revitalized Brando's career, which had been in decline in the 1960s, and he went on to star in successful films in later years, such as Last Tango in Paris, Superman, and Apocalypse Now. At the Academy Awards, the film won Best Picture, Best Actor for Brando, and Best Adapted Screenplay for Puzo and Coppola. Uh, in addition... The seven other Oscar nominations included Pacino, Khan, and Duvall, all for Best Supporting Actor, and Coppola for Best Director. 
The Godfather is regarded as one of the greatest and most influential films ever made, as well as a landmark of the gangster genre. It was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry of the Library of Congress in 1990, being deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant, which is what they always deem it when they put it in the Library of Congress, um, and is ranked the second greatest film in American cinema behind Citizen Kane, which is a crime because this movie is much better than Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane is very boring. By the American Film Institute. It was followed by uh, by the sequels The Godfather Part 2 in 1974 and The Godfather Part 3 in 1990. The budget was between 6 and 7.2 million or 43 and, uh, 43 million and 52.6 million today. And the box office was between 250 to 291 million or 1.8 to to to, to 2.1 billion today. The world premiere for The Godfather took place at Lowe State uh, Theater in New York City on Tuesday, March 14, 1972, almost three months after the planned release uh, date of Christmas Day in 1971, with profits from the premiere donated to the Boys Club of New York. Before the film premiered, the film had already made $15 million from advanced retails from over uh, 400 theaters. The following day, the film opened in five theaters in New York, Next was the Imperial Theater in Toronto on March 17th, and then Los Angeles at two theaters on March 22nd. The Godfather was released on March 24th, 1972, throughout the rest of the United States, reaching 316 theaters five days later. The television rights were sold for a record $10 million to NBC for one showing over two nights. The theatrical version of The Godfather debuted on American Network Television on NBC with only minor edits. The first half of the film aired on Saturday, November 16th, 1974, and the second half, two days later. The television airings attracted a large audience with av- with an average uh, Nielsen rating of 38.2 and an audience share of 59%, making it the eighth most watched film on television, with the broadcast of the second half getting the third best rating for film on TV behind Airport and Love Story with a rating of 39.4% and or 39.4 and a 57% share. The broadcast helped generate anticipation for the upcoming sequel. The next year, Coppola created The Godfather Saga expressly for American television in release uh, in a release that combines The Godfather and The Godfather Part 2 with unused footage from those two films in a chron- chronological telling that toned down the violent, sexual, and profane material in its NBC debut on November 18, 1977. In 1981, Paramount released the Godfather epic box set, which also told the story of the first two films in chronological order, again with additional scenes, but not redacted for broadcast sensibilities. The Godfather trilogy was released in 1992, in which the films are fundamentally in chronological order. The Godfather family... A Look Inside was a 73-minute documentary released in 1991, directed by Jeff Warner. The film features some behind-the-scenes content from all three films, interviews with the actors, and screen tests. The Godfather DVD collection was released on October 9, 2001, in a package that contained all three films, each with a commentary track by Coppola and a bonus disc containing The Godfather Family, A Look Inside. The DVD also held a Corleone family tree, a Godfather timeline, and footage of the Academy Award acceptance speeches. So, we're doing this movie because it's probably my all-time favorite movie for my birthday, and I couldn't think of anything else I (laughs) wanted to do. (laughs) Well, you thought of a lot of other stuff. This is what we came down to. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But we start off the movie... And I also re-listened. I, I, I've listened to the book before on audio on Audible, and I yes, listened to Jason it again. Yes, Jason did not watch this again well, for this podcast. I've watched it ten thousand times, um, so I could do. This. I did watch it last night, folks, yeah. so I am fresh. <laughs> yeah, and there's only. I'll, I'll just address it right off the top. There's only some minor differences between the book and the uh, the movie. The book we get characters POVs, whereas the movie we're. I don't know how you would say we're just objectively the audience or something we don't really get inside the characters heads and stuff also they cut johnny fontaine's storyline um from the movie 
uh, for the most part. He shows up in the beginning, and then we hear a little bit of him at the end, but that's it. Um, where he has a pretty big part in the book, but it's not really that important. And uh, I can't think of her name now either, but um, the girl that Sonny sleeps with at the wedding is also part of the book. She gets a bit of a storyline, but it's cut from the movie for the most part. Um, it's really not that interesting. Uh, and since Puzo helped co-write the screenplay and he wrote the book, I feel like, you know, he just trimmed the fat off his own story and made it work for cin- cin- uh, cinematic purposes. If, and the other difference, I guess, in the book is since we get POV characters, we go back and forth in the timeline. Like, there's a chapter where Sonny's revealed to be dead, and then we go back and we're with Sonny in the next chapter. So, that's how it goes. Um, but yeah, we're at uh, Connie and Carlo's wedding. It is 1945 New York City. Um, you know, we meet Vito Corleone, his his son Sonny, Fredo, Connie, blah, blah, blah. We meet most of the family. They're waiting for Michael to arrive. Michael is the estranged brother that's been gone because he served in the Marines in World War II mm-hmm. uh, against his father's wishes. His father didn't want him to serve. Uh, they're waiting for him to arrive. He shows up with his girlfriend, Kay Adams, and he's telling Kay all about his family. And uh, Luca Brazzi, the guy who works for his father and everything. And that, well, I guess I should start with the opening scene with Americo. I can't remember his last name right now. But um, the guy who gives the I Believe in America speech. Um, mm-hmm. I think he also starts the book, but it's at the trial, if I remember correctly, uh, where the guys who attacked his daughter get off. Um, here we cut right to him coming to the Godfather, Vito Corleone asking for his help. And, you know, Vito says, you know, you, you never came to me before. You believed in America, blah, blah, blah. Da, 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 da. Should have came to me first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I'll help you. And a fun fact is that the cat that Marlon Brando is holding this scene just wandered onto the set. <laughs> and Brand- Brando liked it. So he started, <laughs> um, it was actually purring so loudly that he had to dub over his lines again. Because the cat, like, on the microphones, they picked up the cat and not Brando talking. <laughs> so he had to dub over his lines again uh, for this scene. But yeah, the cat just wandered onto the set and Brando was like, oh, cool. Hey, um, cat. <laughs> now, I one of the reasons, I mean, this is one of my all-time favorite movies regardless, but a big part of it is I'm a huge Marlon Brando mark. Uh, I think he was the greatest actor that ever lived. Uh, that being said, he's also notoriously one of the most difficult actors who ever lived. There are, if you look up behind the scenes photos, uh, poor Robert Duvall is wearing the script because Brando didn't learn his lines. <laughs> so he would just look at Duvall's chest and like s- say the lines when he was supposed to say it. But it also goes to show how good of an actor he he was at like the actual acting because he didn't learn his lines and but he d- gives this incredible performance that he won a freaking Oscar for and rejected. <laughs> There's a whole thing with that too. He uh, sent a Native American girl up because uh, he rejected the Oscar because he didn't like the portrayal of Native Americans in American film cinema and she got booed off the stage because of you know, liberal Hollywood, um, but we, we won't dive into the politics of that at the time, but um, at any rate, Michael shows up at the party, and Vito's obviously very happy that Michael came, and uh, Vito's having meetings with other people, he has a meeting with Luca Brazzi, who Michael explains to Kay is this terrible monster that works for his father, and uh, then Johnny Fontaine shows up. Okay, just being like... Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, actually, I have a note here that Lenny Montana, the actor who played Luca Brazzi, was so nervous to be working with Brando that during the scene where he was talking to him, he actually flubbed the lines. And then Coppola uh, liked it so much. Like, he liked the genuine nervousness that he had, that he had the scene of him practicing. He filmed that scene later of him practicing the Love speech. That. Yeah. <laughs> like, he liked that. He thought, like, the character of Luca Brazzi would be intimidated by Vito Corleone, the godfather. So he kept it in there. Like, he was like, no, that's great. Um, Johnny Fontaine shows up, who some people will say is Frank Sinatra. Um, there's no hard evidence that Johnny Fontaine is Frank Sinatra. There's a lot of rumors that Johnny Fontaine is based on Frank Sinatra. But he shows up, sings a little song at the wedding. He's this, you know, big pop culture icon. But really, he's come to see his godfather, uh, Vito, and ask him for a favor because he wants to be in this new waltz which is supposed to be a stand-in for the warner brothers uh picture and the owner of the company waltz won't let him be in it because he hates him and Vito says oh don't worry about it i'll take care of it i'll make him an offer he can't refuse 
(laughs) (laughs) And he sends Tom Hagen out to do it. But before all that, they take a family photo. Mike introduces Kay to his drunk brother, Fredo, who um, they explain in Godfather 2 that Fredo had pneumonia as a baby. And that's why he's a little slow. And that's not in the book at all. Like, Fredo isn't slow at all in the book. Interesting. Yeah, he's just um, easily distracted, I would say. By (laughs) women. By by women, for for one. Um, But he... uh, yeah, and ADHD with women too. Yeah, there's there's a there's a slight difference there between Fredo in the book and Fredo. Also, he's called Freddy all the time in the book, not Fredo. I guess they called him Fredo in the movie to give it more of the Italian feeling. But <clears throat> they take a family photo, which Kay doesn't want to be in. But Michael's like, "No, come on, get in the photo. You're going to be my wife someday." And they they take the family photo, and then Tom Hagen flies off to Hollywood to uh, take care of. Uh, jack waltz and make sure that johnny fontaine gets in the movie he has a meeting with waltz waltz rejects him he's like get out of here you tube hood blah 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 then he finds out tom Hagen works for vito corleone and he's like oh come up to the house and have dinner and everything oh look at my beautiful horse here um he's like isn't this isn't this the most beautiful horse you've ever seen i love this horse more than anything (laughs) mistake (laughs) i hate this horse Yeah. yeah and uh Walt says, listen, Fontaine's never going to be in that movie because he stole a girl from me and I'm going to ruin him because of it. I'm going to drive him out of Hollywood. Blah, blah, blah. Um, Tom Hagen says, all right, have a good have a good night. And he leaves. And in the Godfather video game, you play as a, a two-bit, two-bit hood, like a Corleone enforcer. And you're actually the character that cuts off the horse's head and puts it in the bed and everything. <laughs> but Walt wakes up the next morning and there's a, he's covered in blood. And then he finds uh, Cartoon, I believe is the horse's name. He finds Cartoon's head in his bed with him and starts screaming. It's one of the most iconic scenes yeah, in cinema. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. it's one of those iconic scenes that you just, like, know about. Yeah, even if you've never seen this movie, you've seen this scene. It, even if you've never seen a movie, you know two things. There's a horse's head in the guy's bed, and Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. <laughs> even if you've never seen a movie, those are the two things you know. Um, but, but You're so right. <laughs> yeah, so Hagen comes back to New York... And uh, Vito gets a big, you know, thing of flowers. It's from Johnny Fontaine. He's in the new Waltz picture. Yay! And then Vito has a meeting with Solozzo, who is this drug guy. They call him the Turk and everything like that. And he's he wants to do business with the Corleones. Vito, because of his code, he doesn't like drugs, doesn't want anything to do with drugs. Gambling, prostitution, all that's fine. But no, nothing to do with drugs. And he says to Solozzo, you know, I wish you luck in your, in your endeavors since your business has nothing to do with my business, blah, blah, blah. And Solozzo takes it very personal because Corleone has all the ties to all the politicians and blah, blah, and he can help them in a situation. And also, mistakenly, Sonny Corleone says, oh, you mean the Tatalias will guarantee our business? So Solozzo realizes that Sonny's interested in it where the father isn't and forms a plan to take the old man out, as it were. So... Vito's coming home one day, and his bodyguard, Polly is called off for mysterious reasons. He's feeling sick and can't come to work that day. So Fredo goes out to get the car. Keep in mind, in the movie, Fredo's an idiot. <laughs> um, Vito goes off to buy some fruit. These two hoods show up and shoot uh, Vito, seemingly killing him. He falls down, uh, but he survives, gets taken to the hospital. Michael's out on a date with Kay. And they walk past a newspaper stand, and Kay notices that there's a headline saying that Vito Corleone was shot because back then they did both morning newspapers and evening papers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you'd have the evening paper. Um, Michael makes it back to the house, blah, blah, blah. They're forming a plan to get revenge on Solozzo. Solozzo has also kidnapped Tom Hagen and gives him the information. He says, listen, you know, Sonny was hot for my deal. You're going to make the peace between us and we're going to do this. And then he finds out that Vito survived and is in the hospital. And he's like, well, damn it. Now the deal's no good. Um, and uh, Sonny is angry. Sonny wants revenge uh, for the attempted assassination of his father. Michael's like, no, you know, you got to chill out. You got to be cool. Anyway, I'm going to go visit dad in the hospital. And he goes there. And this this is one of my favorite scenes from the movie. He's there and there are no 
there's no protection for Vito. He's like, where are the cops? Where are the and detectives? And the nurse is like, oh yeah, the cops shoot everybody out of here. And you're like, oh, it's the cops are in on this. Yeah. Got it. And Michael realizes what's going to happen. There's going to be another assassination attempt. And he has the nurse move his father. And he says to him, I'm with you, Pa. You know, symbolizing he's there to take care of him. But also, he's part of the family now. He's going to be in, in the business. And then Enzo the baker shows up, <laughs> who had previously, you know, uh, Michael helped him out because uh, Enzo fell in love with, you know, this the guy's father. But he was uh, an Italian immigrant that was taken over during World War II and was going to be mm-hmm. sent back to Italy. Vito fixed it so that Enzo could stay. Uh, Michael's like, listen, you, you know, you're going to help me. And he's like, yes, I'll do anything for your father, for your father. So they go outside and they make it look like they're two, you know, gangsters standing out there. The car drives by, that are the men that are going to go to assassinate Vito, and takes off. And I love this scene because Enzo's trying to light a cigarette, and his hands are shaking. Michael takes the lighter, lights it for him, and then looks at his hands and realizes his hands aren't shaking. Like, this is what he's meant to do. Like, he's not nervous about any of this. Because he grew up with it. Yeah, well, and, you know, it's his terrible destiny. <laughs> you know? um, one of the things that Coppola was interested in this movie was that He didn't see it as a gangster movie. He saw it as like a Shakespearean story. It's a story about this father and his three sons, all of whom inherited some personality trait from him and like the family element of it, which is true. You know, it is a family tragedy when you think of it. Yeah. And obviously Michael got the best element because he's not only as cunning as Vito, but he's also calm. Like Mm -hmm. Sonny is abrasive and rash. Uh, Fredo in the movie is an idiot, but in the book he's just more easily distracted by women and gambling and drinking and stuff. But it and and then there's Tom Hagen too, who's the adopted son, blah blah blah. Um, but uh, Michael and Vito are very similar. Um, Michael is much more cruel than Vito is, but very similar. So at any rate, after this happens, the cops then show up because it was all a setup. And there's McCluskey, who's a police captain, who punches Michael in the face for back back talking to him, breaking Michael's jaw and everything. And then Michael sits down with his family in another iconic scene, and he comes up with the plan, because they're trying to figure out how to take out Salozzo and take out uh, McCluskey, pretty much, because he's a dirty cop. And Michael comes up with the plan, he says, um, you know, I'll kill them. Like, they think that I'm just a citizen, they don't think I'm part of the family, blah, blah, blah. Get, get me somewhere with them private, or somewhere public, so that I feel safe, blah, 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 and I'll kill them. And it works. Mm-hmm. Um, they find out where, where it's going to be, because McCluskey is a police captain, so he has to be available 24 hours a day. So he leaves the, the number of the restaurant that he's going to be available at. They find that out. They set up a gun there. Um, Michael asks permission to go into the bathroom, comes out. Blasts them, kills them, <laughs> yeah. takes off. Point blank in the face. Yeah, and then Michael goes, gets taken over to Sicily to protect him from everything. And uh, around this time, Vito comes home, which another little fun fact that I found out about the movie was that Marlon Brando filled that bed that they were carrying him in on, like mm-hmm. carrying him up the stairs. He filled it with 45-pound weights so that he would be heavier as they were trying to carry him <laughs> up, the, up the stairs. Um, like, just as, like, a little prank on, like, the people that were carrying him. Um, so, uh, Vito's very upset that Michael was the one that had to do it because he thought Michael was going to be legitimate. But Sonny takes over the family business and he's running things. Meanwhile, Carlo, uh, Connie, Connie's uh, husband, has been beating her. <laughs> And yep. Sonny is not very happy about that because he doesn't like his little sister being beaten by her husband. The Tatalia family notices this. I skipped over them having killed Luca Brazzi. I forgot about that. The Tatalias and Solozzo killed Luca Brazzi, uh, who was the Corvéone enforcer. But that's not a, a. It's more important in this in the book, I guess you could say, because it's really stressed how vital Luca Brazzi is. Um, Here it's like, eh. But so. Sonny is very angry about the abuse that his sister is going through, and the Tatalia family takes notice of that. Unnotes to the audience and to the Corleones, they get in contact with uh, Carlo and come up with a way to get Sonny killed. So Carlo, again, beats Connie, and Sonny takes off to go after him and gets caught at a toll booth, and at the toll booth he gets assassinated. 
and in this time Vito mostly recovers he can walk and talk again and everything like that and he takes back over the family business and has a meeting with the other families and he says you know I lost a son Tatalia lost a son um, but uh, we're gonna have the peace now and I'm gonna bring Michael back and if anything happens to Michael I'm a very superstitious man and I'll blame people in this room for it but you know for now we're gonna have peace Michael comes back, and he's starting to be trained by his father to take over the business. They send Fredo out to Vegas because he's going to be involved in the casinos out there, um, which is not a very good idea for someone who's distracted by women and gambling <laughs> and stuff and drinking, but <laughs> it is what it is. It's probably safer to have him there than in New York where he'll just get himself killed, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael uh, tells uh, Tom Hagen that he's no longer going to be consigliere. He's just going to be the family's lawyer. Um, because his father's taking over his consigliere and, and he's running the family now. Uh, he tells Tessio and uh, Clemenza that someday they're going to form their own families, but not until the Corleones are legitimate, blah, blah, blah. And everyone thinks Michael's weak and doing a terrible job. Uh, in the meantime, he meets back up with Kay. And, uh, while he was over in Italy, he married this poor girl. And, uh, Apollina. Ap- uh, Apollonia. 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 And... Uh, he fell in love with her and she fell in love with him and Michael's enemies found out that he was over there and his one bodyguard Fabrizio sold him out, planted a bomb in the car and Apollonia went to uh, show off to Michael that she can drive like a good American woman can because women in Sicily didn't drive. She starts the car and boom, Apollonia gets blown up. Michael comes back over, marries Kay. Um, and Forces it upon Kay. He just like shows up like... Well- Hey, and and the th- the thing about this too that they don't really I, I guess you can fill it in yourself, but the move it, it takes place over years. Yeah, like it, if you're just watching, you could be like, is this a couple weeks? Like this is the craziest <laughs> like thing. Like, but it <laughs> this the story takes place over ten years. Uh, well, that, and that's the thing. And I'm like, imagine some guy like coming back from like being abroad for years and mm-hmm. going, hey, you're gonna marry me now, right? Like yeah. I need you, like. How do you know she married already? In, like, well, in the in the book, we get Kay's perspective a lot. Um, well, at least at this part, and um, she's constantly trying to get in contact with Michael. She has no idea where he is or even if he's alive. Tom Hagen won't tell her anything. He like yeah. we get we get that one scene in the movie where he's like, now if I take that letter in a court of law, they could argue that I know where he is because I took that letter. Blah, blah. Yeah. In the book, um, uh, their mother is there, uh, Mrs. Corleone. And she's like, I'll take the letter. <laughs> like, she's, like, she's like, I'll tell Mikey, like, you're a good girl. She's like, but well, you should go off and marry someone else. Like, you, she's <laughs> like, go you're, away. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're too good of a girl for Michael. <laughs> like, no, go go marry someone else. And uh, like three years go by, I think, in the book or something like that. And Kay, uh, I forget how she, she finds out that Michael's back somehow. And she calls the house and the mother answers. And she's like, Oh, okay. Did you ever get married? <laughs> like and, <laughs> the mother is like, please tell me you yeah, got married, yeah. you stupid woman. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, no. And she hasn't been with anyone else either. And like, that's the thing with her and Michael. Like, she's like, oh, Michael, have you been with anyone else? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> she, she's like, you pig. No, she doesn't say that. She's more like, oh, well, that's the way men are. Blah blah blah. But um, yeah. Uh, but they they get back it. And the thing too, another difference in the book and the movie is that Kay. Not that she's cool with Michael being a murderer and everything like that, but she's more understanding, like, this is what he has to do than she is in the movies. Um, I don't know if that makes her more independent or less independent or whatever you want to say, but she's much... I think it's much more of a time period thing for... Like, she does become Mm -hmm. a a school teacher and everything like that, but there weren't that many options for women in the 1940s and 50s. So, like, even though she's college educated and everything like... And she went to Dartmouth... (laughs) <laughs> but, yeah. but but uh like she uh i i guess it's more of a time period kind of thing mm-hmm. um anyway so michael's back and he's in charge of the family and he's saying that they're gonna go legitimate um and Vito dies um in the book it's a little bit different he's on his own his grandson isn't there um but he passes away relatively peacefully he has a heart attack and dies um and then before he had died he told michael whoever comes to you to offer peace that's the traitor in the family and he finds out that it's tessio that tessio has been at work with brazini and and tatalia this whole time and blah 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 blah. 
Um, and so Michael becomes the godfather. He's godfather to Connie and Carlo's children. And then again, in one of the most iconic scenes, as the baby's being baptized and Michael is becoming the godfather, he has all the heads of the five families and Mo Green out in Vegas who slept. Uh, Sonny, or who slapped uh, Fredo around in public and won't sell his stake of the casino to the Corleones. Uh, he has all of them taken out at the same time. And he becomes the godfather. And in the final scene of the movie, uh, he's Kay asks him, is it true? Did you have Carlo yeah, killed? Yeah, he did have Carlo killed. Yeah. I think we skipped that part. Yeah, he yeah. did have Carlo killed as well. Yeah, he had Carlo killed and Tessio killed. And mm-hmm. Tessio says, like, you know, could I get off for old time's sake? And no, sorry. Um... But yes, he also has Carlo killed in the car and everything like that, choked out by Clemenza. Um, I've skipped over Pauly being killed earlier, too. Uh, that's another iconic scene. Leave the gun, take the cannoli, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but uh, Michael sets, gets revenge against everyone, consolidates all the power, because even though he's supposedly going legitimate, no, he takes over everybody. Like he did, There's no five families anymore. There's only the Corleone family. They're in charge of everything. Um, he becomes much more of a monster than his father could have ever possibly have been. And uh, the final scene is Kay coming to him and saying, you know, did you have, to, did you do this? Did you kill all these people, including, you know, your brother-in-law and stuff? And he's like, don't ask me about my business. Okay, this one time, one time I'll allow you to ask me about my business. She says, did you do this? And he lies to her and says no. And she says, oh, thank God. And she goes in the other room and these other men come in, Clemenza and other men, and they're kissing his ring. And they they call him Godfather. And in the final iconic scene of the movie, Kay's looking, and the door closes on her. And then we get. <laughs> I won't dive into it again. But yeah, this is this is one of my all time favorite movies. Um, was there anything else you you would like to discuss about it, or should I just dive no, into the No, I trivia? mean, I was just I was just here to hear you say things, and I'd be like, oh, that's <laughs> interesting. I told you that in the car on yeah. the way here. I was like. No, I'm, I I just expect it's going to be you talking a lot and me going, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened. So. Well, I, I, have a, I have some trivia here, and then I have some factoids that I know about it. Uh, okay. Um, so the cinemat- You've got factoids, yeah. folks. <laughs> the cinematographer Gordon Willis earned himself the nickname the Prince of Darkness since his sets were so un- underlit. Paramount Pictures executives initially thought the footage was too dark until persuaded otherwise by Willis and Francis Ford Coppola that it was to emphasize the shadowiness of the Corleone family's dealings. Interesting. It sets a tone. Uh, Marlon Brando wanted to make Don Corleone look like a bulldog, so he stuffed his cheeks with cotton wool for the audition. For the actual filming, he wore a mouthpiece made by a dentist. Uh, This appliance is on display at the American Museum of Academy the American Museum of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles in a special Godfather exhibition. That's something, too. The studio did not want Brando whatsoever. They were very much against Brando. Coppola had to fight tooth and nail, and the studio finally said, okay, if he auditions, and we like his audition, which at the Marlon Brando was the most famous actor in the world, one of the best ever, and it's very insulting to say he has to audition. So Coppola cleverly told him that he had the role and that he was just going to film a screen test of him and so he did that and like brando stuffed his mouth with cotton balls and stuff and did his hair a certain way and like made himself look a lot older and he showed that to the paramount executives and they said what are we doing watching this film of this old guinea and they said he said that's marlon brando and they're like damn it okay he can have the role they were also very much against pacino because pacino had never been in a movie before and they wanted Robert Redford for Michael Corleone, <laughs> which not the Marla, uh, Robert Redford's a great actor too, but like blonde, six foot two, mm-hmm. blue eye, like that's not Michael Corleone. <laughs> like I'm sorry, um, but he had a fight for Pacino, and Pacino every week was threatened to be fired by the executives, like they, him and Coppola. They were like every every like week they were sending the dailies and the weeklies to the executives and they're like "Mm, we don't like you know you guys are on the chopping block like they were under a lot of stress oddly enough um i couldn't confirm this i i saw it on a couple websites but i couldn't find interviews to confirm this evidently um robert de niro who plays young brando or a young vito corleone in godfather 2 he was actually in this he played Polly originally and Mm -hmm. um him and pacino got into an argument on set and he walked off evidently 
I only saw I saw it on a couple websites. I couldn't find anything with either one of them talking about it. So I don't, I don't know if that's 100% true, but that's evidently a little factoid out there. And then during an early shot of the scene where Vito Corleone returns home... Oh, I mentioned this already, that he put weights under under the bed to make it heavier. Um, but yeah, uh, this is... If I, had to make, if I had to make a top five, this is easily in my top five favorite movies of all time. Uh, probably number one. I know a lot of people prefer Godfather Part Two over this, but I'm a, like I said earlier, I'm a big Marlon Brando mark. Um, so I'm giving the movie a 10 out of 10. <laughs> I don't know what kind of rating you want to give it. I didn't write down an overall score because I forgot to do that. Uh, I did not write down anything. I'm going noteless today, everybody, yeah. for everything we're doing. Uh, I would say like 8.59 out of 10. I enjoy this movie. Like, Well, this is the last episode featuring <laughs> Ashley, folks. Um, <laughs> Look, look. It's not okay. It's not for me. <laughs> yeah. Like I enjoy it, but I'm not like yes, this is the greatest movie ever. Like it's good, but like I also I don't know. I just think at, like, at, for, like I think it gets long at points. Like I oh, think yeah. there was definitely a point where I was like God, I forgot how long this movie is. It's still going. Well, it's, it's almost like three movies in one. Yeah. Like, you have the family relationship, you have Michael over in Sicily, and then you have everything after that, too. Like, when they when Michael comes back. Like, it's almost three movies. If they made this today, it would be three separate movies. Yes. And now, each one of them would also be three hours long. <laughs> but, but, but it's... You're right. Yeah, like, it, it's almost three separate movies all smashed together. Um, but it's good. And like I said, they cut... Uh, storylines from the book like there's a john johnny lucy mancini i think is her name um they cut her storyline and they cut johnny fontaine's storyline from from uh from the book for this um but yeah uh, if if anyone's interested out there and listening to the book you also get paragraph like eight or nine paragraphs in a row about how big uh sonny corleone's penis is so you know there's that for you if you're, <laughs> if you're interested in that um but yeah, I, I give it I give it a ten out of ten. I give I give the book probably like an eight out of ten. Like it's one of those rare occasions where I actually think the movie is better than the book, um, just because like I said, it, it trims the fat that the book had in it um, and gets it down to like the core. It sounds story. like there's a lot going on with the book. Mm. Like Johnny Fontaine has this whole storyline about how he can't sing anymore, mm. and it's getting harder and harder for him to sing. Yeah, and it turns out because all the doctors in L.A. are just like yes men they didn't actually really examine him and he has like these um it's not cancer but he has like something growing on his vocal cords i can't remember like polyps or something growing on his mm-hmm. vocal cords once he gets those removed he can sing again and there's also a plot that um vito corleone gives him money to start his own movie studio and that's and mm-hmm. to thank him he brings his old partner back from the old neighborhood over and makes him a star and da, 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 and then that guy's life falls apart but but um but that, that's basically a johnny fontaine storyline and it intertwines with i think her name's lucy, lucy mancini uh it intertwines with her storyline because he ends up in vegas she's in vegas too and blah 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 but um yeah i don't know is there anything else you any questions you have about the, the, the no i don't think so and yes i'm i'm pulling a, a ken from the barbie movie and talking about the godfather that the, I, I i saw the barbie movie and there's a scene where uh to distract the kens one of the barbies goes up and says oh could you explain the godfather to me and, and talk over it while it's playing and everything and i was like <laughs> oh that hit a little close to home but it's still funny very funny <laughs> it, it hit a little close to I'm home just kidding. Yeah. it's I, I recommend that movie too that's not making my top five but it, it is a good movie um, well, with all that out of the way, this has been the Once Again Podcast. Any questions, comments, or critiques can be addressed to our email at onceagainpod at gmail.com. Follow us on our social media accounts, Once Again Pod, all one word, on X and Instagram. If you would like to contribute to the podcast, we have several tiers available on patreon.com slash onceagainpod. As always, a like, follow, or share would be greatly appreciated. Thank you and have a wonderful day. And remember, we will entertain you. We will always entertain you. And happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jason. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da
Da-da-da-da. <laughs> 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 <laughs>